This is my grandmother. She had nine children. My mother is the one on the top right. She had my brother and I quite young and my second brother in her late 30s. Babies in our family were adored and abundant. In fact, I over, have over 20 first cousins. Even as a child, I always knew I wanted to be a mother, so I assumed get, getting pregnant was the easy part, but not getting pregnant before I was ready was crucial. When I married my husband, Stephen, at age 30, we figured we had no reason to rush. We started trying in 2003 when I was 32. I was so optimistic that I bought the book, What to Expect When You're Expecting, after a month. During a routine annual physical, my OB suggested we not wait a full year before we thought about seeing a fertility specialist if I didn't get pregnant. And I thought, what are you talking about? My grandmother had nine kids. Turns out that my grandmother and my mother's fertility had nothing to do with mine. I had to learn the hard way that I had spent most of my life trying not to get pregnant. I had no idea that fertility in women begins to decline in our mid-20s and drops sharply after 35. This chart's steep angle tells part of what may have been happening with me. So we entered the rotten world of infertility quietly, like most people do, afraid to admit that we couldn't get pregnant like everyone else. We told no one and cringed when we were asked why we didn't have kids. Despite being nervous about taking any medication, risk of multiples, and unknown long-term side effects, the first drug I was prescribed was Clomid. Think lots of hormones, lots of eggs, and lots of side effects. I took three cycles of Clomid and didn't get pregnant. It was time to up the ante. In the next procedure, IUI, you're jacked up on more hormones that you in inject directly into your belly twice a day in order to produce more eggs. Sperm is then placed directly in your uterus while you're on a cold medical room staring, staring at the ceiling tile. It's not exactly romantic. In fact, I hated it. I hated the small needles. I hated the giant intramuscular needles, the bruising, the hormone patches, pills, night sweats, weight gain. I hated the endless fighting with insurance companies, and I hated how sad and alone I felt. Out of sheer exhaustion, I think we started sharing our struggles. It was difficult fielding unsolicited advice like, you'll be fine, my friend's cousin got pregnant at 42, or why don't you just adopt, or you need to just relax. Despite our pain, we marched on. And although we felt so isolated, we were in fact not marching alone. One in eight couples struggle with infertility. One in eight. The CDC finds that the number of women in the United States aged 15 to 44 that experience infertility is 6.7 million. We were getting frustrated, so we did research. Alternative therapies seemed promising, so we went to Boston to consult a Chinese herbalist. I drank tea that I'm pretty sure was dirt. I received acupuncture, stopped running for a while, which was a bad idea. I meditated and did yoga, which was a good idea. <laughs> Our calendar year went like this. IUI 1, failed. IUI 2, failed. Take a month off, I'm exhausted. IUI 3, failed. Take a few months off, start antidepressants. IUI 4, failed. Take another month or three off. IUI 5, bullseye. This was, in fact, the tasteful way we chose to tell our parents that I was finally pregnant. <laughs> our first ultrasound confirmed that I was, in fact, pregnant with triplets. Despite my panic over having multiples, I grew to embrace the idea of our little three-pack, began a pregnancy journal, and made a list of baby names, Alex, Katie, Sam, Elizabeth, Shane, Tierney. I was incredibly nauseous and exhausted like any other pregnant woman. I was thrilled. At my eight-week appointment, the ultrasound tech told us that one of the heartbeats had stopped. This news was devastating, but we figured there are two other babies and they'll be fine. However, at the next ultrasound, the other two heartbeats had slowed. They told me to go home for the weekend and see how things looked on Monday. 
By Monday, the other two heartbeats had stopped. I had lost all three. We planted crocuses that would come up the early, in the early spring, the time the babies would have been born. I was utterly distraught, as you can imagine, but eventually I thought, well, at least I got pregnant, and I still had some hope. The next step is IVF, and in this procedure, you're surgic you surgically remove an egg, fertilize it in a lab, and then return it to your uterus once it's dividing properly. After the fourth IVF failed, our doctor called us in to discuss next steps. My chart read, decreased ovarian reserve, which is kind of like a catch-all. This meant that given my age, my eggs were not of the quantity or quality that you would expect. No one knew why. Then she said something I'll never forget. You should consider donor egg or adoption. And I can recall the details of that conversation so vividly, I felt like my support team had given up. I thought, have my husband's sperm fertilize an egg from another woman? Are you kidding? This sounded like science fiction, and I was sure she was wrong and just not trying hard enough. Stephen, again, did extensive research. He's good at that. <laughs> and found a leading fertility doctor in Boston. After reviewing our giant file, he confirmed our previous doctor's recommendation to try donor egg, but said he would support us if we wanted to give my eggs one last try. A new team, a big name hospital, and renewed hope. Of course, I would try again. We drove four hours round trip for 10 minute ultrasounds time and time again. More needles, more hormones, more fighting with insurance companies. They placed our last hope embryo in my uterus, and we were instructed to return in two weeks for a blood test to see if it took. They recommended against using at-home pregnancy tests. We did not listen. <laughs> Friends and family were as elated as we were. Finally, it was our time. I drove again to Boston to get the ultrasound around two months to see our little baby growing. But the look on the tech's face, we could tell that it was, again, for us, bad news. It was a silent, long ride home, and in April of 2008, I lost another pregnancy. This time, we planted a Japanese maple tree. Despite being emotionally raw, we decided to attend a seminar aimed at those considering donor egg or adoption. Couple after couple shared their painful infertility stories that ended with parenthood. I asked through tears, what does it feel like not to be able to pass on your own genes that were so important to me, your family history, and how could you ever recover from that loss? Couple after couple assured me, once you have your child, that loss isn't as important. But at that point, I didn't believe them. After the conference, one generous couple who has two boys through donor egg invited us over to their home. They were sincere and very funny, so we decided to take them up on the offer. What did we have to lose at this point? They apologized for the toys everywhere. They put the kids to bed, and we talked about how hard the first three months of parenthood can be. But what about being so different? The husband, Larry's reply is etched in my memory forever. Don't get me wrong, he said. Our kids are weird, but it isn't because of how they were conceived. <laughs> He's great. <laughs> and he doesn't remember saying that. It's so it changed my life. Through the kindness of strangers, we imagined ourselves jumping in. So donor egg it is. And again, we were not as alone as we thought we were. Between 2005 and 2014, the number of cycles performed using donor egg increased almost 27%. Interestingly, the CDC reported in January of 2016 that for the first time ever, the birth rate of women in their 30s was greater than those in their 20s. This is a significant shift that may also lead to more use of assisted reproductive technologies. We then began the conversation with our fertility clinic back here in Springfield to review anonymous potential donors. Stephen and I considered what traits and medical history were priorities to us and put our faith in the nurse who was screening and would match us with a donor. A few weeks later, I was having my first photography exhibit. In the middle of the evening, my cousin Marie approached me and said, I heard you were looking for some eggs. I'm not that tall, but my SAT scores are really good. 
Through my father, Marie had learned of our struggles, and she stepped forward. It's a moment so utterly generous at such a dark time in my life that remembering it is always overwhelming. Despite the potential risks to family relationships, I decided that the idea of having a donor I was related to was preferable. I would be able to have some genes in common with our child. I could contact Marie about family medical history, and our baby would never have unknown gaps in her genealogy. Marie was a lawyer, bright, thoughtful woman who clearly understood the ramifications of egg donor. I took comfort in that, but still it was my husband's sperm and her egg, and that was so difficult to wrap my head around sometimes. But at this point, we had been through so much that the idea of being at the forefront of fertility science and family making seemed surmountable compared to a life where I could never get pregnant and give birth. On the day of the transfer, I was again optimistic. After fertilization, the team chose the best embryo out of the two and placed it in my uterus. I sobbed when the procedure was complete, as I had done every single time before. Now we wait. She was worth the wait. During my pregnancy, and even right after the birth, I worried that Tierney was not fully mine. That anxiety grew when a few people referred to Marie incorrectly as the real mother. However, my insecurity about being so different was replaced with the reality of breastfeeding every four hours, poop explosions, <laughs> and the most overwhelming love like I have never experienced. <sighs> Tierney's now seven, and she is a strong, inquisitive, thoughtful girl. Without the slightest exaggeration, we are grateful for her every day of our life. About two years later, we were ready to roll the dice again with our second embryo, and given the success with Tierney, I was sure we would get pregnant again. But I was devastated once again. Remarkably, another one of my cousins from the other side of my family, Kelsey, offered to help this time. Despite being almost half my age, she appreciated the pain we'd endured. We were overwhelmed to be lucky twice. Plus, she was good buddies with Tierney. The first transfer with Kelsey's eggs did not work, and all the previous disappointments reemerged. We waited and tried the second embryo. When I had been pregnant for several months, we literally had a bonfire with the mountains of paperwork that we had accumulated from over a decade of infertility. We were done. Here is Elizabeth. And Elizabeth saying, cheese. Elizabeth eating black cake, <laughs> and Elizabeth not using her gentle hands with her sister. <laughs> Elizabeth is three and very funny, and I will say strong-willed. <laughs> She's perfect. She squeals with delight when she hears her sisters up in the morning, and some days I think my chest could burst when I see them together, when they're not punching each other. <laughs> we are now the regular parents we worry we would never be. And this is our beautiful mess. She only has one shoe on. We drag through vomit-covered nights. We lose our patience, and we forget to fill out school forms. Tierney has memorized every single LEGO Star Wars episode that exists. And Elizabeth wears bathing suits in our house 12 months out of the year for some reason. I don't know why. Larry was right. Our kids are weird. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with how they were conceived. And they know how they were conceived. We have always told them their conception stories, and in fact, they will be quite surprised to know that two people can make a baby without the help of a team of doctors and a donor. I'm not the same person I was before all of this. I wish infertility wasn't something that I had only heard about because it was happening to me. I wish I hadn't felt so alone. So what do I do with that? Well, I want better for couples going forward and I wish there was more awareness about the prevalence of infertility. I know that nothing can take away the pain of an empty crib, but I also know that generous listening can dissolve shame and change lives. I run an infertility support group, and I have seen that firsthand. University of Houston research professor Dr. Renee Brown, my TED Talk hero, puts it like this. 
Shame depends on me buying into the belief that I am alone. Shame cannot survive being spoken and met with empathy. I am not alone. There are millions and millions of us. And I'm here to say that I'm done with fertility shame. I'm here to speak that unspoken. I had miscarriages, I was infertile, and it nearly crushed me. The way out was a path I never envisioned and I never even knew existed. But luckily for us, the empathy of two amazing women, one kind and funny couple, and a team of medical experts helped us plant our family tree, but also helped heal our pain. But this really isn't about me. I ask you today to think about your own family, your friends, your colleagues. Remember, one in eight. Think about the childless couple whose wedding you attended seven years ago, but doesn't have kids. The woman in your office who has a lot of doctor's appointments. Your brother-in-law who's really good with kids, but never mentions having any. Some of those couples want to keep their stories to themselves, but others will appreciate your thoughtful support. Feel free to borrow my story. Forward this talk. Just make sure you follow up in person and say, I just watched this, what do you think? Then just listen. Don't give advice, don't offer solutions. Please don't say, you should just relax. Maybe try, I'm so sorry, and I appreciate your sharing this with me. It will be hard to listen to those stories. It will be really hard to stay quiet. But do it anyway. Just sit with them in their pain.